the ask. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, let's see. Uh, I've been working in crypto for quite a long time at places uh, such as MetaMask, DAPUB, Aave, Lens. I've also done some consulting work with Centrifuge and Radical. Um, and now I'm the co-founder of Exonumia, which is a research and product strategy firm focused on decentralized coordination networks. Uh, I call myself a longtime enjoyer of these networks because I remain optimistic about creating new institutions and keeping public infrastructure open and accessible for everyone. Just a, I thought about giving this talk. Oh wait, sorry. Uh, I thought about giving this talk as a way to distill some of the more protocol-esque topics, but in a style that's like kind of digestible for application developers. Um, I think the amorphous and swarm style of development that is relatively special to crypto and open source is very cool, but it can also be very difficult to kind of keep track of. Uh, so I'll try to make some connections between what protocol changes mean for application developers. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just try and explain these things as best as I can, and why they're important, um, and what kind of success criteria are for some of these things. Uh, but in case I end up being wrong, we can just consider that a disclaimer. Um, this talk was also partially inspired by the roll-ups aren't real phenomenon. So lots of credit to John and Kelvin for um, kind of putting this out there, putting these ideas out there and trying to take some of this kind of amorphous blanket style uh, terminology that we have and trying to make it more legible uh, and get people discussing the concepts behind the terminology. Uh, there's a good paper that I think John wrote, which is quite good. I would recommend you guys give it a read. Um, but yeah, the talk also comes from this like application and product person perspective. Um, I feel like a lot of conferences uh, this one included, right, it's, it's good to focus on the protocol developments and the protocol developments are what drive kind of use cases, but application developers at the end of the day are the ones that have to come and integrate these protocol changes and, and change their applications and talk to their users and figure out how to solve, you know, kind of on the ground problems for people. Um, and that's where I've always kind of tended to make my home is in the application layer. I think that all the work that we're doing is super important, but if no one can use it, there's really almost no point. Um, but yeah, so the trade-off of understanding when something in protocol or around protocol is done enough to be relied upon when you have end users to worry about and kind of working through those trade-offs that come with wanting to ship now to users versus having to wait for all solutions to be identified and then ossified at the protocol level is a real challenge that people building applications face in this space. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot at some of these various projects that I've worked on. Um, so before getting into some more like details, I would present a bit of a generalized spectrum framework, um, which I think is really important for understanding like technical adoption of the underlying protocol technology that we're building. Um, and it's a spectrum of kind of decentralization and fragmentation. Uh, and I think it's important that we think about protocol changes through this lens. So um, if we wanna grow adoption for open protocols, we have to understand what the trade-offs are so that we can provide better building blocks and solutions for app devs to use more composable and more decentralized technologies. Um, because currently, I mean, most applications that are used by anyone are centralized and fragmented. Obviously, most apps that are used by people are not uh, like crypto apps today. Um, so yeah, the composable to fragmented access Composability is positive, right, because you get innovation, you get general interfaces, aka standards. Um, you can take, you get the benefits of ecosystems and networks instead of walled gardens and siloed applications. Uh, if you take nothing away from this talk, I think the main point is just like we should do more standards work at the protocol level. It makes it a lot easier for application developers to uh, really commit. Um, and then, Fragmentation is bad because it means users have to do more work to discover, to discover safe and good applications. And in crypto, this is one of the huge kind of barriers of adoption to what we're working on. People don't, people need to be safe to use this technology. We have kind of like irreversible things that are happening. So you need to be able to uh, make sure that you're helping users in this way. It's, a, it's kind of an additional challenge baked on top of everything else that's challenging. Um, 
Another thing that's bad about fragmentation is developers have to spend time figuring out what providers to use and trust. This is a problem that a lot of labs teams have in the space is trying to decide, you know, should we roll our own infra? Should we wait for an infrastructure provider to be like sufficient enough for us to be able to use it? Um, that's a huge challenge in like choosing which development or like which infra providers to go with. Um, you also wonder like if they'll be around in the future. Are these infrastructure providers going to be resilient? Uh, have they set up their incentives correctly, et cetera? Um, another issue with fragmentation is we have to spend more time educating people on individual solutions uh, and setting to work instead of working together to solve these problems. I think this is like another standards call out. Um, and additionally, we just end up competing for attention, which I think uh, in an interesting way is like we're all kind of ostensibly working towards very similar goals. And I feel like in the past few years, I've just seen people saying, oh, like my solution is the correct one and you should use mine. And I think this is like a little bit of, it's a little bit of like marketing speak in some way, but it's also just like, it really hurts us when we have to describe, you know, you make a, you make a, your own terminology for very like general things and, and then like trying to get people to adopt that and then the education that you've done does not transfer into, you know, another app that should work for them in a similar way, but now they have to kind of go through and relearn everything that they've already spent time learning. Um, yeah, and then on the centralized, decentralized access, I think this is like probably more known to people here, but just, uh, decentralization is positive because it means you get the robustness, you get the re neutrality, you get censorship resistance, you get optionality, um, and then centralization is bad for, you know, many reasons probably, but for me, I think it's because it makes the, op the environment we operate in quite fragile um, and it reduces agency. So at the sweet spot on this one, I think the aspirational quadrant over on the top right. Um, okay, so now, can get into some of these terms. I'll start with account abstraction, and uh, this is the world when we have it universally. So what is account abstraction? Um, it promises a better experience for users at the account level. Uh, account abstraction is a blanket term, but it also references an EIP, which is 4337, that proposes a new mempool for user operations. What's good about it and what does it solve? So smart contract wallets are incredibly more feature rich than EOAs, which is like the standard account type that exists today. Um, it gives you things like the ability to abstract gas away from users, the ability to batch transactions with which applications provide one click UX. Um, we can get things, safety features like spending limits, whitelisting accounts, account recovery. Um, these are all things that are totally required for giving a reasonable experience and assurance to users that are transacting with any type of value. Um, and so any feature that you kind of want to add could be added into a smart contract wallet, but this is something I think is very, it's almost too powerful, right? This is something that we have to be careful with. So the challenges and drawbacks of account abstraction are um, we have a strong reliance on wallet providers to adopt these standards. Um, this will cause, again, fragmentation at the wallet level. No longer will all of your accounts be compatible and portable. I think this is a major, you know, this could be a barrier for people. Um, you might not be able to, for example, use your MetaMask wallet in your Rainbow app anymore. It's just an example. It's not necessarily true, but um, I think it also will make wallets less composable with applications. Think of like the existing Connect wallet modals today and how many options you have. I think this just kind of explodes that in a certain way, unless uh, we work on kind of standards and generalized interfaces. Um, the, another risk, right, the smart contract risk, is just a risk that comes for accounts that EOAs just don't have. Um, and then there's also like increased gas costs over EOA. So those are some some drawbacks and challenges that that still exist, even though you know this this account abstraction concept promises to bring a lot of benefits to end users. Um, and then some success criteria for account abstraction. Um, so requires adoption, requires distribution, and requires an upgrade path for existing users. Um, in my opinion, coalescing on a few great solutions here is reasonable. Gnosis Safe and Obvious Wallet could be potential candidates. Um, barring that though, a generalized wallet SDK or just like, you know, more robust standards. Um, I'm a formal verification maximalist, I guess, <laughs> in a previous life, and so, the formal verification of these smart contract wallets implementations is very important so people can be safe with these things. They're gonna be the most, um, 
like in control of the most amount of funds anywhere if once this like goes through. Um, and then uh, just to call out, there's an there's a proposed like EIP seven three seven seven as an upgrade path for a one click transaction to migrate an EOA to a smart contract account. Um, so just some like open questions I think that still exist. So for me that are like maybe answerable. Um, so I, I'm around since the days of meta transactions, and given that those never really took off, like why are we so sure that account abstracted messages will have more success? I think it's going to be because all accounts will eventually be required to upgrade, or like to upgrade and work this way, but you still will have this long tail of EOAs that don't upgrade, and I think that will be kind of a very uh, fragmented experience for people who don't ever make this opt-in change. If you've ever worked on an application, you know how hard it is to get people to upgrade or to change something that they are totally fine with uh, from the past. Um, another question is who pays for gas uh, for users when transactions are non-financial? I think you know the, the financial use cases in crypto, we are fairly well understood and, and uh, we've built a lot of infrastructure around them and to support them, but as, as more actions come on chain, uh, you know, the, where the value is, uh, the V and MEV is subjective, like how does that, how does, how does a, an application subsidize uh, user action in a economically, uh, like, reasonable way? Uh, and then I think, like, one other thing is, it feels like the 4337 user operation mempool becomes the foundation for intents in the future, but I think that's kind of still to be seen. Um, Okay, yeah, so just like a quick summary. So yeah, better onboarding. Um, I think another interesting one actually is the potential to own the entire UX flow for applications. So I think we will see a lot more vertically integrated application experiences and I think account abstraction will help with that. Um, so next is app chains. So pretty much every application developer has to decide, at least today, has to decide if they wanna deploy on a base layer or create an app chain. Um, an app chain is a blockchain that exists to service a particular use case instead of a generalized settlement layer. Uh, many app teams with actual users consider building app chains as a scaling mechanism uh, while they wait for better, lying, better underlying infrastructure. So the good things about app chains are you get better scale and triple transactions, uh, you get purpose-built applications, which can more naturally, again, lead to vertical integration. Um, you can create pockets of composability on app chains. Think of like uh, in another world, there's like a DeFi app chain that is all these DeFi apps composed and that's all we use them for. And when NFT launches occur, you don't get like crazy gas fees on, on your DeFi chain. Um, they can also be used for ephemeral or shorter lived applications trying things out. Uh, this is like relatively new phenomenon. It's kind of interesting. I think there's a lot more experimentation that's being seen here. Um, challenges and drawbacks of choosing an app chain is that you miss out on the network effects or you can miss out on the network effects and firepower from more generalized mature chains and ecosystems. Um, the custom logic required for application chains um, is like not, is more robust usually than just like deploying a smart contract. Um, another huge problem on app chains is the need for custom integrations with providers such as custodians. Uh, so again, just like a very fragmenting experience for developers, meaning customized builds, uh, customized integrations for many things. Um, and it's also harder to bootstrap a composable ecosystem because of competition between protocol style apps. Um, I think I view app chains as kind of a temporary solution as we work towards scaling underlying block space uh, or until we solve synchronous messaging between chains. Um, yeah. So. I think a requirement for app chains to be accessed or for us to move off of them is the synchronous message passing between instances, different block space, uh, standards and composable interfaces. IBC does this pretty well. And then no more bridge hacks. If you guys can solve that, that would be great. Um, okay, what is an intent? Uh, an intent is a way to express a preference for a user operation without caring about its specific execution path. Uh, it's important to understand that these typically have a domain associated with them, and for most intents and purposes, uh, when people talk about them in crypto, they typically mean expressing preferences over all relevant block space in order to simplify the UX of having to know how to create a transaction that satisfies your constraints. Uh, what's good about them is they provide uh, <laughs> 
an abstraction above transactions and gives us an opportunity to iterate on UX in a meaningful way. What do they solve? Um, disparate and multi-chain connectivity. So infra can be multi-chain aware without applications needing to integrate multiple services. I think this is gonna be actually really helpful for application developers. Um, they essentially bundle the services that today's yield aggregators and other aggregators provide and generalize them. Um, I think intents are a very fragmenting thing that attempts to actually decrease the experience or appearance of fragmentation. So that's, that's kind of interesting about them. Uh, challenges and drawbacks, they're hard to understand because they're so amorphous. The infrastructure for them is not very mature. Um, solvers, not gonna be totally efficient right away, but probably still better and they'll improve over time. Um, yeah, I think for them to be a success, I think, again, like standards work will be super helpful here. I think we require like contextualization of user interactions that is at times quite hard to get at because a lot of data that exists about user transactions that's not on chain is just like also already today siloed. Um, but I think we'll start seeing people working on things like libraries of user flows or like um, dictionaries of intents or something like that. And then also just, I think this is another thing that we don't really do that well, but it's, it's hard to pin down how it would be accomplished well, but like safety scores or something similar to that for making sure that the long tail of potential operations are legitimate. Um, So light clients. Light clients are a path for us, in my opinion, to achieve like truly decentralized applications. Light clients verify consensus in an efficient way. Um, they verify that data such as past transactions or value in a smart contract state is actually a valid element in the blockchain state. Uh, so instead of validating all the transactions are valid, you just validate the proof of stake signatures are. Um, What's good about light clients, they reduce the trust in full nodes. So today pretty much you trust other people's full nodes uh, to tell you everything about the chain. Um, and so which makes the full nodes basically too centralized and too important. Um, a light client should be able to run in the browser and can interact with a blockchain by verifying the blockchain fully in the browser or an application. Um, the challenges and drawbacks are that you still need full nodes to host data and provide it, um, and they've historically been difficult to, actually the engineering work to that's around like clients has been difficult to achieve. Um, there's no like good examples, for example, on Ethereum today. Um, requirements for success, again, I think ability to run the browser is huge for this, and then the real end goal is that every dApp can uh, verify the data served by the RPC provider with the light client instead of blindly trusting uh, it before showing to data to the user. So yeah, it's big unlocked for real decentralized trustless applications. Full nodes are still required, but we can decrease the reliance on them and uh, they're difficult to build. So many have tried, we should continue trying. And that's what I've got actually for today. Um, I'll be around if you wanna come chat about any of these things or anything else. And yeah, I have a bit of time for questions, I guess, if anyone's curious. Hi, Tobias. Uh, awesome talk, thanks. Uh, you said you're formal verification maximalist. How far do you go? You are a formal, ver you announced yourself to be a formal verification maximalist, right? Yes. So how far would you go? Like, what has to be formally verified? How far, far down to the, I don't know, the, the byte code or like, where do we, how, how far do we go? I think, I mean, in a practical sense, I think that anything that can be formally verified should be, uh, but it's not necessarily practical to do that. Um, I think, you know, things that are touching user funds, things that you're building as kind of long-term public goods infrastructure, I think things where we have shared specifications that have been standardized, I would advocate for things like those to be formally verified. I think the things that I mentioned here, like uh, smart contract wallets, if they become kind of closer to the protocol as it, it 
kind of will be. I think that's a huge one. Um, yeah. What about you? What do you think? Yeah, that, that, yeah, I mean, I guess we don't know how far we can go, but start by just churning out some proper specifications that we could actually use for formal verification. I think that's, that's an awesome starting point. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you.